Thank you. I thought about giving my speech in sign language, but forget any signs since my brother died. If I give my speech in sign language, we'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe all night. <laughs> so I'll leave it to my interpreter. Do my interpreting for me. All right, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. Catherine, thank you for your great leadership of the Disability Caucus for the Iowa Democratic Party and uh, all your wonderful work in making sure these issues get in the forefront and not put behind someplace. So Catherine Chris just does a wonderful job, and I thank you again for that. I, I got here late, so I didn't get to see everybody. I don't know how many of these elected officials are still here, but I wanted to recognize them. Alex Waters is here from Sioux City, for crying out loud. Hey, I saw Ben Rogers, my longtime friend here on the Board of Supervisors. Art stayed. Is Art still here? He was. I didn't see him, but someone said he was here. Maybe he was here and gone. Uh, Rob Hogue is here. I know, because he's been taking pictures of me back here. Senator Rob, someone said Jeff Danielson is, oh, there he is, right there, Senator Danielson. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Uh, Liz Mathis, is Senator Mathis is here, too? Well, I'm sorry, well, let's hear it for Liz. She was here, but I missed her. And Representative Liz Bennett. If I missed anybody, it's because I just didn't get your name. But so if, if you're an office holder, please stand and introduce yourself. Or if you want to be an office holder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's this? Kimberly Graham for U.S. Senate to take your seat back. <laughs> I know what's running here. Who? Christian Andrews running for the Iowa House, District 95. District 95. <laughs> Christian, thanks, Christian. Who else did I might have missed, didn't see, and say hi to? I'm Sheila Yates. I'm running for the Memoir School District. One of my platforms is supporting families, uh, students, as well as administrators and education with regard to uh, diversity with disabilities. So um, I'm very glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Who else didn't I see? That's it? Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. And I, I, I just have to say, I, I got here about halfway through Chris Dodd's presentation. And you know, I, Chris and I came to the Congress together in 1974. And so we've served together, although he went to the Senate before I did, but then we got together in the Senate and we were on the same committee, on Ted Kennedy's committee. We got for almost, well, 30 years, I guess, now that I think about it. Well, I was there for 30 years. He was there longer than that. But uh, I'm sitting there looking, ah, boy, that Chris Dodd still has it, doesn't he? Yes. Boy, I tell you, what a firebrand, what a great guy. Uh, Ruth and I have personal friends with Chris and Jackie for so many years. Uh, uh, just, I just can't say enough good things about Chris. His compassion, his interest in, in, in human services and, and, and making sure that our laws uh, take into account uh, those that may be on the bottom rung of the economic ladder, those that have been socially ostracized in our society for so long. Uh, you just couldn't ask for a better champion uh, and a more eloquent spokesman than Chris Dodd and it's just a Pleasure again, Chris, to see you back here in Iowa. I look forward to seeing you back in Washington sometime. Thanks, Chris Dodd. Let's hear it for a great presentation. You know, Chris and I both ran for president. Not at the same time. But neither one of us made it, obviously. <laughs> so, but we both tried, and, and but, but we never gave up advocating, advocating for a better, more just society. Well, okay, next year, 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, huh? And I'm glad that Tony Coelho was here. Uh, you know, Tony was one of the first people to start it. 
uh, in the House uh, and in the Senate, you know the first person to introduce the Americans with Disabilities Act in the Senate was not me. <coughs> it was not even a Democrat. It was a Republican by the name of Lowell Weicker from your state, Chris, from, from, from Connecticut. Well, I was his chief co-sponsor, but at that time the Republicans were in charge of the Senate, so he introduced it, I was his chief co-sponsor, then he got defeated in an election, and then I took it over and then became the chief sponsor and the lead sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it was my bill that was finally uh, enacted into law on July 26, 1990. So the four goals of the ADA, hmm? we know what they are, right? Full participation. Equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. So, four goals. Well, I think in 30 years we have to kind of take stock. How have we done? And I think not only to take stock, but also to, at this time, set some markers down about where we want to go. What more needs to be done? How do we fill in some of the gaps? that we know exist out there. Well, for persons with disabilities, I know I can say that progress towards full inclusion and a barrier-free world is agonizingly slow. And common sense solutions like universal design should have been adopted years ago. But as the lead sponsor of the ADA, I can look back at 30 years of steady progress. Yes, steady progress, including, I might add, adoption by the United Nations on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was fashioned after the ADA and which 177 countries have now adopted, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But there is one nation that still has not ratified it, the United States of America. Now again, Barack Obama signed it, so we are a signatory but the Senate has yet to ratify it. And so what we need is not only a new president, we need a Senate that will ratify the United Nations Convention. Let me just say that not as any excuse for less than rapid change in inclusion and a barrier-free environment, we must recognize that we are overcoming centuries of a patronizing, sympathetic mindset passed down from generation to generation against persons with disabilities. When I'm asked what are the toughest obstacles to remove for full inclusion, I always respond, it's not the physical barriers, but the attitudinal barriers that's embedded the attitudinal barriers embedded in individuals, societies, and yes, even religions. People challenge me on that. I said, well, you know, when you look at most religions in the world, the way they treated persons with disabilities was with sympathy. <coughs> and the medical model, <laughs> that if you're a person with disability, there's something wrong with you. Hmm? And so, it's sympathy, not empathy, but sympathy. And that is to be pitied. And when you pity people like that and you have that kind of sympathetic attitude, you get ostracized and you get set aside. You get put into institutions. Um, and it leads to all kinds of bad things. We went through a eugenics movement in the United States in which people with disabilities were can I say it? Or euthanized in our society back around the turn of the 19th, uh, into the 20th century. Big eugenics movement. And uh, quite frankly, Adolf Hitler cited the, our eugenics movement in Mein Kampf. We had the famous case of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the young woman uh, in, uh, in, in West Virginia sterilized against her will because uh, because Chief Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said that three three generations of imbeciles are enough. Buck v. Bell, that's the name of the case, about, uh, about Carrie Buck, a young girl of 17. After that case, 
the Buck v. Bell, which allowed for a state to sterilize a person against that person's will. Over 80,000 people in the United States were summarily sterilized. The last being in 1981. <coughs> and that decision by that Supreme Court that allowed states and other jurisdictions to summarily sterilize someone has never been overturned. Has never been overturned. Now states have moved ahead on it, but that case itself has never been overturned. Again, it's that idea that somehow if you are disabled, then the state has rights to do things to you without your consent. Well, again, it's the attitudinal barriers that we have to overcome. Now, some of you might say, well, we've gone beyond that. Well, talk to a person who's institutionalized against her will or his will and ask them if all those attitudes have been done away with. But to accelerate these changes in attitudes, we need to change and modify the laws and the customs that buttress these kind of attitudes. Well, like Buck v. Bell, we've never changed the law. Now, states have done this. States have changed different laws and prohibited this. But still, we've never done it on a federal basis, interestingly enough. So there are things that we need to do to start changing these attitudes. I might just say one of the first we're talking about healthcare is the Medicaid bias. How many people know what the Medicaid bias is? Well, a lot of my friends here would probably know. But you know that today, under federal law, that if you qualify for Medicaid uh, institutional care, let's say you qualify for Medicaid institutional care, Medicaid must pay for it. Must pay for it. If, however, you are a person with a disability and you qualify for institutional care, but you don't want to live in an institution, you want to live by yourself in the community with support services, Medicaid doesn't have to pay for that. Medicaid by Why shouldn't it be that if you qualify and you don't want to live in an institution and you want to live in the community, why shouldn't you have the ability to decide to do that? And Medicaid should cover that just like it covers you for an institution. i got to admit failure here. I tried changing that law back in the 90s. It was a bill called MICASA. Hell, I forget what it even stands for now. The Medicaid um, Community Assistance Support and Services Act. Anyway, anyway, we kept trying year after year to get it done, and we never could get it done. And there's a bill in the House now called the um, Disability Integration Act. Some of you yes. may have heard of it, right? The Disability Integration Act. We have enough co-sponsors to vote it out of the House, but we can't get it out of committee. And the committee is chaired by a Democrat. We need to get that bill through. Now, a good friend of mine, maybe some of you knew of Mark Bristow, Access Living in Chicago, one of the great leaders in the independent living movement, one of the great leaders in getting the ADA adopted in 1990. Mark just passed away about... Uh, about a month ago, kind of sudden. Before she died, she got a call from Nancy Pelosi. And Nancy Pelosi said, gee, I'm sorry to hear the, your medical condition and wanted to know what she did. She said, I, I think Nancy said something like, well, I wasn't privy to this own phone call. I knew it from Marcus's husband. She said, well, I wish there was something I could do. And Marcus said, there is something you can do. Get the Disability Integration Act out of the House of Representatives. So I'm hopeful that before the House uh, adjourns for Christmas and goes next year, I hope they'll pass it because we have the votes to pass it. Up. I'm not saying it'll get through the Senate, but at least it lays down a mark. And it'll be the first time that either body has ever passed uh, a, a, a bill to get rid of the Medicaid bias. So any help you can give of uh, convincing the House to pass that would be appreciated. The Olmstead decision. 1989, Supreme Court decided that uh, a, a person has a right to the least restrictive environment. 
where states have not implemented it. Some states have implemented it, some haven't. Well, the Supreme Court did leave a little loophole there. They said states must provide the least restrictive environment. I don't know the exact language, I don't have it in front of me, but it's sort of like, as long as the budget allows it. <laughs> well, states hide behind it and say, well, we can't afford it. They can afford everything else, but they can't afford that. So we need to put more pressure on our state senators and state representatives and governor and whatever to fully implement the Olmstead decision in the state of Iowa to provide the least restrictive environment for anyone with a disability. <laughs> You're talking about, about extending health care. I know Chris got some questions about health care and, and again, He's so knowledgeable on the, on the health committee all those years and getting the Affordable Care Act passed. But it seems to me in, in, in rural areas like Iowa, uh, we always think about how we get someone from there to health care. Why not think about getting health care from there to that person? And what I mean there is telehealth. What I mean is extending broadband to every house, every apartment. Every, everybody in Iowa being on broadband so they can have access to telehealth. I know so many persons with disabilities, they don't have to go to that clinic twice a week or three times a month. But if they had some telehealth and had contact with someone to check up on them, to make sure that their meds are okay, to make sure that they have accessibility, you save a lot of problems for people with disability trying to find the right bus and the right transportation or something to go to the clinic. So to me, telehealth is not only good for, every, for people without disabilities, it, it is extremely important for persons with disabilities. So again, we ought to be having telehealth to every, every house in the state of Iowa. Um, now let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just segue to that for uh, out, of, out of that to employment. Uh, all my life I've been involved in, in some form of disability work. Uh, uh, the first, when I was a congressman in 1978, Jennings Randolph was a senator from West Virginia. And Jenny Randolph and I uh, uh, presented to Jimmy Carter in the White House the first set top box for closed captions. It was a great big box. I got one for my brother, and uh, it was deaf, and he could finally understand closed captions. But in those days, we didn't have <laughs> captioning. A few programs, National Captioning Institute would do it. But then later on, as after I got to the Senate, I was uh, visited by people, individuals from the chip industry, who said, you know that big box you got there? Everything that's in there, we can put on a chip the size of your thumbnail. Wow. Oh, I said, really? <laughs> well, I, they said, you know, all the TVs ought to have something like that. I said, well, we'll have hearings on it. So again, with the leadership of Ted Kennedy, and he put me in charge of the Disability Policy Subcommittee, we had hearings on this. We had all the TV manufacturers, Sony and you know, GE, I don't know, all of them were there, Zenith, I remember. Anyway. Uh, talking about putting this chip in the TV sets. <laughs> well, yeah, they said they could do that, but it was going to increase the cost of the TV set, maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars a set. Well, I recognize there's no way I'm going to get anything built through that's going to increase the cost of the TV set by a couple hundred dollars. So I got a hold of the chip people and in Intel, and I said, you know, this it's going to cost a couple hundred dollars to put this chip in the TV set. And the guy said, yeah, if you make a hundred of them, or a thousand of them, yeah, it costs. But if you make millions of them, it won't cost much at all. So, we got a bill through. It's called the TV Decoder and Circuitry Act, 1989, before we got the ADA passed, which mandated that every TV set sold in America with a size 13 inch screen or bigger, had to have incorporated in it that decoding chip. <coughs> it gave them 10 years to implement it. But it was a mandate. I'm trying to get a mandate passed today, right, Chris, on something like that? Never get it done. Well, then Marriott Hotels uh, 
decided to step forward and without being forced to, they said, we're going to get rid of all of our TV sets and incorporate the new ones with the chip. Well, once they did that, then Hilton wanted to do it and everybody else, and boom, within five years, all the TV sets that sold America had that chip. You know, you get the mute button, you get the closed captions. Guess what the additional cost is per set? Not even a factor. I mean, it's not even a penny a set. So again, I say that. And here, I did this because of my brother who was deaf and thinking about people with deafness or hard of hearing having closed captions. Like, you know who the biggest user of these things are now? Sports bars. <laughs> all that noise and everything so you can follow it all in the sports bars. And how many people here, how many people here who are not hearing impaired or watching TV and you get a phone call or something and you punch the mute button <laughs> so you can still follow it, but talk on the phone at the same time. So, again, you get back to when you design things universally for every... A lot of times I say, when you design or do something for a person with a disability, it helps everybody. It helps everybody. And that was one of them. So anyway, we did that. But since I retired, I wanted to focus only on employment. Because of all those four goals, economic self-sufficiency, has been, and we've achieved the, le the least. You know, you'll hear unemployment rates, what, three and a half percent? Among African Americans, it's twice that much. Among young African Americans, three times that much. Among Latinos and Latinas, maybe three times that much. So figure up 15, 18 percent. People say, oh, that's, that's a lot of unemployment. Think about this. Over 60 percent of adult Americans with disabilities are not in the workforce. 60%. That's a blot on our national character. We have done, we have just not accomplished that one goal of employment. And when I say employment, I don't mean disability employment. I don't mean some dead end job at sub minimum wage with no ability to get ahead. So, I know you're ahead of me on this. What do we need to do? First thing, abolish 14C. Yes. Abolish 14C that allows employers to pay a sub-minimum wage. Get rid of that once and for all. And there are bills in the Senate and the House to do that right now. There's a Disability Employment Incentive Act. Senator Bob Casey in, uh, in the Senate has that in. So if we're going to abolish 14C. We give some credits to employers to make sure they pay everyone at least the minimum wage. Transportation, Title II of the ADA, prohibits any discrimination in public transportation services, buses, public transportation, stuff like that. That's okay, okay fine. But 80% of all transportation dollars in the federal government goes to highways. Not to public transportation in our cities, and our buses, and subways, and paratransit. So again, what we have to do is we have to get more money to back up what the ADA says. When you take 80% of all federal monies and put it into highways, that is discrimination against persons with disabilities who don't use the highways, but need to get to work and back and, and, and live independently in their own homes. The last thing I want, but no, I want to mention also about employment. Competitive integrated employment. I don't want anyone talking to me about employment of persons with disabilities without using those keywords. Competitive integrated employment. That means employment with everyone else, same pay, same benefits, everything just like anybody else. Right. Nothing sub minimum wage at all. <laughs> the last bill I got passed before I left the Senate was a change in, in vote rehab. It's called WIOA, the Work Enforcement, Work Incentive, Workers Incentive and Work in Incentive Opportunity Act. It used to be called WIA. And we made a change there. 15% of all federal monies going to VR, like in Iowa, 15% must be used for youth transition services. So that youth or in high school get summer jobs, summer employment, after school jobs, job following, job coaching, so that they too have some work experience before they finish their IEPs in school and go out.
Lastly, I want to say about my summits, look up harkinsummit.org. We have our summits on employment every year uh, about competitive integrated employment. We've had people from 50 countries attend these. We just had the last one in Paris, France in April. I just returned two weeks ago from the United Arab Emirate, and they're going to sponsor one uh, in uh, either Dubai or Abu Dhabi, one of those two there. So we're starting to extend this globally, this idea of, of competitive integrated employment. I would also just, I have to mention this in terms of employment. You know, if I mention Emily Hillman, does anybody know who Emily Hillman is? Emily Hillman was a young woman, not too far from here. She finished her IEP, got stuck in a sub-minimum wage job folding towels or clothes or something like that. I know I only got a minute, folding towels and stuff. She, she came home one day and told her mother she didn't like what she was doing. And her mother said, well, Emily, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to, I want to have a coffee shop. I want to be a barista. Well, her mother told me later, I had no idea where Emily ever got that idea. Probably watching TV or something. Well, they found that there was a place in Minneapolis where you they taught you how to be a barista. So they took Emily up to Minneapolis. I think it was like three weeks. Taught her how to make cappuccino and all that kind of stuff. Brought her back to their small town with VR, local bank. Her parents, they got a small loan. They found a, a vacant storefront on Main Street. And they opened M's Coffee Company, E M apostrophe S, M's Coffee Company. It's now nine years going. It's the center of the community. People come there to have their coffee, and now it's an internet cafe, and now they serve lunches. Emily now has four people working for them. Four people working for her in that little town. And I tell you, she said all the politicians stopped there. She said, uh, well, I knew she had, uh, well, Barack Obama, of course, and then she had uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, my successor, uh, Joni Ernst. She had uh, Governor Branstad. So it's all, you know, I've said now, woe to any politician that comes to Iowa that doesn't go to M's Coffee Company now because it's become so famous. She even makes her own coffee. You can buy it online. You can go to M's Coffee Company and buy it online. I always... I always joke that M is now in competition with Starbucks. <laughs> Did I mention the name of the town she's from? <laughs> Independence, Iowa. Aww. Independence, Iowa. So, when people tell me, well, someone on IEP, you, you, you got to have sympathy, you got to patronizing and stick them away and sub them away to jobs. Yeah, tell me about Emily Hillman, huh? But every time I see Emily and I see how much she's doing there, how many more Emily Hillmans are there out there whose lives are being wasted and stuck away all over this place? Well, let me close with this, because I did want to challenge you on a couple of other things. And, I, and my friend Chris is still here. Housing. Housing. Um, so in the ADA, we mandated that all buildings must be built accessible in the future, all buildings. We tried to get houses, but we were unsuccessful. We couldn't get that done. Couldn't get houses. And the realtors, everybody said no. So all these years later, what we have is we have houses being built all over America with your money, tax money, one way or the other, that are not accessible. So if you're a person with a disability and you want to live independently, your choices get narrowed down quite a bit as to where you can live. Well, I got to thinking about this. And why? For example, look at this. You've got the low income housing tax credit. Three million units have been built since 1987 with this low income housing tax credit. How many, how many are accessible? Less than 1% are accessible. Section 42 housing, that's the tax credits under the IRS code to investors who build affordable housing. No mandate for accessibility. Section 8 housing, rental assistance for low income. Nothing there about making sure they're accessible. HUD housing, apartments, duplexes, townhouses, owned, publicly owned by HUD. There's no, no requirement for accessibility. And the last big one is this. 
How about your mortgage tax deduction? How about people who buy homes or build new homes and you mortgage your house and you get a tax deduction for that, right? Who wants to do away with that? Huh? Everybody likes that. It's, it's, it's a great, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Why not make it contingent on making sure the house that you build or the house that you're selling is accessible to everyone who wants to buy that house? And we know, we know that if you build a house that's accessible with universal design, it doesn't cost any more in the beginning. It's only after you have to fix it up later on. But if you start changing some of these laws, boy, you'd be amazed how the architects and designers start designing things that are accessible. So again, I say to all of you, when you see all these presidential candidates coming through, ask them, ask them about making housing. All these federal programs, all these tax dollars that go out to federal housing programs, why not make it contingent on them being accessible to everyone? Well, lastly, I've been trying to get a, a question in the national debates. Every national debate that's come up, I've called, I've tried to insert myself with the networks and stuff, but I've been singularly unsuccessful in getting at least one question asked on disability policy. And here's what I say, I said, you know, think about this. The largest minority group in America, covered with a civil rights bill, still discriminated against on a daily basis, and yet you're not asking one question about it. And they say, well, what would you ask? I said, I'd ask, I'd, I'd, I'd put it this way, I'd put it this way. The largest minority group in America, covered by a civil rights bill, the Americans with Disabilities Act, People are discriminated against daily in housing, transportation, medical care, employment. There were four goals of the ADA, full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. How would you, as a, as a president, accelerate meeting the goals of full inclusion envisioned by the ADA, and please be specific? Thank you. <laughs> three letters, I, L, and Y. So you put them all together, and what does it mean? I love you. Thank you.